Thanks, Edmund. So I, I, I don't know what the, the title that I gave if I scare people away or it, the idea was to entice people. So what I'm going to talk about today is basically it, it's a, a talk in two parts. If this works. OK, so it's a talk in two parts. So I will basically for the first 20 or 25 minutes is try and give a, a decent overview on the, the whole energy storage area as, as a, a broad area and to kind of highlight where I'm looking to go in the next you know, decades. I've been working in this area for about a decade at the minute and essentially there is lots and lots to be done into the future. So I'll talk about kind of the, the background of energy storage, look a bit at the, the sustainability of, of energy storage um, and, and touch on the, the different chemistries that we can look at. So the battery chemistry landscape, as we call it. Then touch on the idea of how can we actually really improve batteries on a practical level. And then as, as kind of background context, then for some of the work that I will present is just to introduce the idea of metal anodes and then kind of towards what are called anode free cells. So that'll be the first half of the talk. And then the second half is to really kind of focus in on, on two specific pieces of research, one which was published last year, and a second, which we're just about to submit in in the in the coming days, I would say, rather than weeks. So it's one that's that's really nearly uh, completed, which inspired the the name of the the presentation. The idea is to delve into them in a, in a good bit of depth. So we'll do about ten minutes plus on on each of these, just to really show you the the nitty gritty of the of the studies as they were done. So just as kind of motivation on this, so just to give you an overview on the, the um, greenhouse emissions. So again, the exact numbers here are not so important. They, they will vary from source to source. But the important thing to notice here is that the largest source of greenhouse gas emissions that we have are from energy sector, which is, is energy production, and then on the transport sector. OK, so these are two major sources of greenhouse gas emissions. And obviously we would like to tackle these and try and come up with technology that can can reduce the impact of these. Um, it's worth saying early from the outset that whatever energy storage technology we come up with itself has to be green. So we can't invent technologies to save energy that's coming from renewable sources and have them as highly polluting or, or non-sustainable in the long term. OK, so we need to reduce these uh, greenhouse gas emissions and the, probably the key um, input into that is to make efficient batteries for both of these two areas. So just to give an idea of the, the scales that are involved in these different uh, topics and, and where we're looking at energy storage, we're all familiar with handheld devices. So these are essentially small batteries. And it's the scale of these that's important. So if we're to look at, at moving from a handheld device up to an electric vehicle, you're talking about taking roughly 7,000 of those individual batteries up to uh, an EV level. So there is just as, as I'll show in the in the next slide, they're just assembled small cells into your, your battery module or your battery pack. If you then take a thousand of those again, so you can see we are really moving up in the scales of materials that we need. That's what you would need for looking at stationary storage. OK, so you're making energy, obviously, from intermittent stores of uh, of energy. So things like wind energy or, or tidal or solar. And you need to uh, store parts of that energy uh, to avoid basically avoid wasting it. So you need to uh, have a store for that energy so you can release it when it is really needed. The other thing to note, obviously, then, is that we're talking in, in terms of orders of, of cost as well. So the battery cost for your mobile phone is about $30. Your battery cost for a typical EV, which I will show again on the next slide, is about $7,000. And then when you're into the, the regime of these stationary storage, uh, you're talking about millions of dollars for these individual uh, large scale batteries that we have. Um, at the minute, all of these are dominated by lithium. OK, so I, I'll maybe zoom in here just if this won't break the system to give um, this is a nice overview kind of on, on the scenario that we're in at the minute. OK, so this is our state of the art lithium ion. All of those three systems that I mentioned at the top are basically relying on lithium ion at the minute. So lithium ion is the is the only game in town at, at a meaningful level at the minute for this energy storage. So within the state of the art lithium ion battery, you have lots of give and take and you have lots of, of push and pull factors within that state of the art. 
So you have performance factors on one side and you have sustainability factors on the other side. So even within the performance side, depending on the chemistry that you're using, some of these can be in competition. So for example, the power density of a battery and its energy density are nearly always negatively correlated. So there will always be materials that are better for high energy or high power. And we're always trying to basically come up with the, the sweet spot for what we really, really need. Beyond that then, and these are particularly interesting for electric vehicles, we have things like the fast charging ability. Okay, so one of the main hurdles for electric vehicles at the minute is that you need to, to charge them overnight essentially, or, or the availability of fast charging is a real hurdle. And obviously then you have the, the lifetime and safety. On the right hand side of that weighing scales is the sustainability side of things. So we have lots of things that are further down the chain in, in some aspects that we need to think of. So the idea of the carbon footprint of the, the battery that's been made in the first place, but also then things like the elemental abundancy, can it, they be sustained over decades or ideally hundreds of years, you would want to develop this sustainability into the materials. Um, things that are really coming on stream now is ideas of recyclability, where you can essentially take your battery at the end of life, once it has gone through its second life, which is also shown there, and go back to your starting materials, salvage out any of the, the key or critical elements that may be in those batteries for future use. So the state of the art is the one that's shown on the left. And what we were hopefully, if everything goes well, moving towards is this ideal scenario on the right hand side where we have two different poles to the, um, the energy storage landscape, where we can look at uh, what's called here ecologically optimized lithium ion batteries, and that would be for high energy applications. So it's not by mistake that what is shown there is an electric vehicle. The reason for this in, in, in all simplicity is that lithium ion is very difficult to beat in terms of energy density. Okay, so that's lithium and kind of beyond lithium ion, so lithium metal and so on, they very much fall into that bracket. So we can have, we need to increase the sustainability of those, absolutely. But this is for that tract of, of really high energy density batteries. It's difficult to look beyond lithium, certainly in the, in the short term. The bottom then shows the sustainable alternative battery technology. So this is where we're looking at changing the dial here and moving it up towards the sustainable uh, side of that battery development, and that's for stationary applications. So that's where we start to invoke these beyond lithium ion technologies, things like sodium ion technologies, and there's other alternatives that we can look at as well. Okay, so what we're hopefully moving towards within the, the, the next couple of decades is a scenario where these battery chemistries that we use are more uh, tuned towards the actual applications. Okay, so at the minute, as I said, the lithium uh, batteries, they, they dominate the current market, but the materials reserves, so we use, uh, even within these, if we just look at lithium, we use a material that is geographically limited. It's difficult to get lithium in the first place. You have to extract it from brine and so on. So having lithium as the solution for all of these different applications is probably not sustainable into the long term. So the last line there is that lithium will only be part of the solution moving forward. OK, so from a scientific perspective, this is really, really exciting. Uh, just to briefly touch on the idea of, of EVs. So to give you an idea of just some of the headline uh, values, as I said, it's, it's pure background, but it, it's, it's as much a curiosity as anything else. If we were to take a, this is a, an old Tesla uh, Model 3 at the minute. So your battery cost is about $8,000 for that battery. The battery size that's shown there is 70 kilowatt hours. It can get you about a range of, of nearly 400 kilometers. And then you see you have the difference between the fast charging ability where you're getting maybe half your range in half an hour and the slow or overnight charging that you have there as well. So just in terms of the material use for that uh, battery that's there, you're talking about about 60 kilograms of lithium carbonate um, as your lithium source within the battery, and you would be looking at about 55 kilos of graphite in that uh, battery overall. The kind of state of the art materials that are shown in this one, and I have a small caveat at the end, 
is that the anode is, is usually graphite um, and it's possibly boosted by a small uh, per percentage of silicon. That's essentially a, a capacity boosting additive, which would have a specific capacity of about 372. And it's a low voltage because it's your anode material. On the cathode side, so the ones that's shown here is, is NCA. So you can see that this is a, um, a lithiated transition metal oxide. So it's Li, Ni 0.8, Co 0.15, AL0052, uh, so that's just called NCA. So what that is, is it's a reasonably uh, high specific capacity cathode material and has a decent discharge voltage. So what I would note with this is there has been a change in, in very recently, actually the end of last year, where uh, Tesla moving forward are going to use LFP, which is lithium iron phosphate, as their cathode materials in the majority of their uh, EVs certainly in the in the mid-range vehicles and and that's kind of a retrograde step in some ways in that the energy density of LFP is lower than NCA but what it does show is it shows the importance of those kind of pull factors push and pull factors that the cost is what's driving that and sustainability so essentially the LFP is cheaper more sustainable so Tesla are now moving back a step almost in, in the development and using LFP as their cathode material so just to show again, show the kind of what we're looking at when we really talk about these batteries is they're the batteries that you would have been familiar with in terms of the cylindrical uh, cell format. What we have is we have a, a long anode roll, this jelly roll type assembly here within a, a cylindrical cell. You have an anode material, a separator and a cathode. And it is quite simple in that you had just different form factors here. So you have 18650 all the way up to 4680 here where you're just essentially packing more of that uh, electrode into a given form factor. So when we're talking about moving from individual cells up to an EV level, it is an, it, it, it's an oversimplification to say you just uh, stack them all together because there's lots of complex BMS and the, there's cooling as well. But what you're doing is you're taking these individual cells and you're combining them together into your overall battery pack. So to give an overview then on the, the battery chemistry landscape, again, is kind of a kicking off point for some of the, the research that we're, we're doing. The state of the art is lithium ion. It has lots of strengths and that is worth noting. Sometimes when people are working on beyond lithium ion batteries, they fall into the trap of saying that it's going to solve every single problem, that sodium ion is going to kill lithium ion and is going to you know, really take over the entire market. I would uh, debate that. For lithium ion, it's an established system, it's proven, it has really good cycle life, it has good balance between power and energy density. But as I said, there is definitely weaknesses in terms of the sustainability and also safety concerns that are well publicized. So we have two that I would flag on the sustainable side of things. This would be something like sodium ion battery or aluminium ion. So both of these have uh, sustainability bonuses potentially compared to lithium ion, just based on the elemental abundance of the two materials. But it's also worth noting that if you're going to have a, a sodium ion or aluminium ion based technology, you still need to use sustainable materials beyond that within the rest of the cell. For sodium ion, what's nice is that there's some similarities to lithium ion, so you can expedite the development a small bit, but the weakness depending on your application is that the it's almost invariably going to be lower in terms of its energy energy density. With aluminium ion, uh, again aluminium ion I would say is a step beyond or a step below sodium ion in terms of the, the level of development. It has this sustainability bonus um, but and it also has the plus three ion which can potentially allow for higher capacities. But with this, it's um, it's more complex mechanistically, and it also has some electrolyte hurdles too. For the high risk, high reward, so this is moving towards the high performance side of things potentially. So you can look at the the sulfur containing cathodes, uh, the metal anodes, and also the air type systems. So again, I don't want to go too much into these, but these are the ones that I would class as high risk, high reward. Okay, so these are ones that, in all honesty, when we scale up to real um, EV level uh, cells, they may not may just not be compatible with that level of device. OK, so there's lots of challenges on the development for these different chemistries. For lithium sulfur, 
potentially we have a very high energy density um, and we also have the sustainability of sulfur as a major bonus on the cathode side. So some of the weaknesses is that you have a requirement for lithium metal as your anode and as it stands that the um, cycle life is quite short and there's lots of mechanistic challenges and little hurdles that we need to um, beat as well. On the lithium metal side, Again, we have high energy density potentially, and if you're looking at a truly anode-free type cell, you don't need to worry about anode material development at all. You're literally just plating lithium onto your current collector. Weaknesses of that will be we have limited cycle life, and there's also safety concerns. And then finally, the lithium air type system, which is one of the, the systems that I worked on quite a, a while ago at this stage is the strengths is that it has a very high theoretical energy density and I have that underlined as a, a, a intentionally because the theoretical values are fantastic but when we look at a practical system we start to dilute that energy density that we can really achieve. Um, it's a still a very interesting system and we also have the benefit with that that uh, oxygen is a sustainable cathode active material. So potentially you can take oxygen from the air and use it as your cathode active material, which is very, very interesting. With that, again, it's the same sort of uh, issues that we have very limited cycle life. It's a complex system invariably because we're looking at just using oxygen. So we either need to use a pure oxygen cylinder or we need to extract oxygen exclusively from air. This isn't meant to be completely exhaustive. There are other systems that are there, things like potassium, calcium and magnesium, but they are all at different uh, stages and pretty much in their infancy in terms of practical development. So to just throw these up very quickly, the idea here is, is to show the breadth of different systems that we can look at. OK, so the idea, in all honesty, moving forward into the, into the coming years on a research side is there are so many different little mechanistic hurdles and little scientific challenges that we can address in these different systems. So what we have been lucky enough to do in UL is now build up an expertise um, level within the PIs and within the researchers that we can now attack all of these various systems in parallel. Okay, so we can show in the top left, this again, just schematics to show the, the types of systems, looking at sodium mine in the top left, aluminium mine in the top right, lithium air in the bottom left and lithium sulfur in the bottom right. So what you can see is that the, the complex um, chemistry that's actually going on there is different and we can address basically any part of these cells and try and understand them, which is the most important part of, of the development. So with sodium ion, for example, you can look at the uh, active material development on the cathode or anode side. And it's nice here that there are similarities between the active materials here and what we would use in lithium ion. So on the cathode side, for example, we're looking at layered oxide materials, which can really benefit from all that development that has gone into the lithium side of things. For the anode, we have a slight hurdle in that we can't use graphite, which is usually used in lithium ion batteries. So we need to look at either different carbon types, which would be things like hard carbon or alternative anode materials as well, which will uh, motivate the, the first study that I'm going to present from our research on the aluminium side. As I said, it's far more complex. So you're looking at interactions between your aluminium ions and the electrolyte, whereas it, it tends to be active as an AlCl4- uh, complex within the system, which just complicates the, the mechanism of what's going on. In the bottom right, or the bottom left, sorry, for uh, lithium air batteries, you're physically looking at making and breaking down uh, discharge products during your cycling. So rather than just looking at simple intercalation of ions or alloying mechanisms, we are now looking at forming solid oxides or peroxides in the case of the lithium air battery and having to break those down every single cycle. Okay, so you can see that all of these uh, systems can be developed in parallel in that we can learn from the, the findings within each system, but they each have their own little intricacies that we really need to unravel. And finally, then for the lithium sulfur, as I said, it, it's complex mechanistically. So you're looking at, at having a reversible lithium metal anode. And on the cathode side, you really need to control the discharge product that forms and also control this polysulfide shuttle too. 
Okay, so I have two more slides on the background side of things, and I'll eventually get into the, the real meat of the talk, which is, is the, the findings. But again, as more context, so how can we actually improve these batteries? So I'll show two scenarios here. This is from a really nice recent investigation where they looked at the prospect of scaling up different chemistries. Okay, so what's shown on the left-hand side, this is our, our snapshot of the state-of-the-art uh, lithium-ion battery. So you can see the, the proportion in, in volume of what the different components actually take up in your cell. So what you have briefly is you have your uh, anode current collector moving left to right. So you have your anode current collector here. You have your anode active material, which is a mix of graphite, binder, and conductive carbon. You have an electrolyte, which is contained within your separator here in the middle. You have your cathode material, and then you have your cathode uh, current collector here. Okay, so when we're talking about bringing uh, chemistries from the lab scale up to the practical scale, we need to look at this at the full cell level. So we need to look at what the implications of switching out this graphite material for a new higher capacity anode, for example, will actually look like at this level, because that's where we get the meaningful data in terms of things like those energy density values that I mentioned. OK, so what we could look at and one scenario here again, this would be for the second study that I'm going to present is the idea of a lithium metal cell. So this is at the same scale here again. You can see your cathode is actually unchanged if you can compare the two of those. And what we have done is we have replaced the graphite anode on the left hand side with the lithium metal anode on the right hand side. So the idea with this is that we can drastically reduce the anode thickness and in doing so, we increase the energy density of our system overall. OK, so there's just a couple of, of notes of caution, and these are my kind of soapbox things that I would like to say. So just first note of caution is that it can take decades and tens or hundreds of millions of euros to move from a lab to a product, particularly on the battery side of things. There are lots of battery startups that have done huge amounts of, of uh, funding um, generation in terms of bringing these chemistries from low TRL to high TRL, and it takes time. The second thing is that isolated performance metrics can be very misleading. So there is within the um, within the field, there is sometimes I feel an over reliance on things like specific capacity values where you're comparing to the state of the art. It can be very difficult to compare apples and oranges sometimes. So what is best is to have an internal system where you're comparing sample A with sample B in your scenario, and at least then you can have a comparative performance um, that you can really rely on. Last thing here is that black box or non-reproducible studies are to my mind worthless. So sometimes if you if you come up with a, a new wonder material and you fail to give all of the parameters of how it's formed, how it's really tested. Again, it's just the idea that all of the performance metrics that we have need to be placed in context. So the last thing is how can we actually contribute? So that with those notes of caution, I know it might seem that I'm being cranky, but it's the exact opposite. So what I'm trying to do is divert us away from, again, diversions where we're actually wasting our effort. So what we need to focus on is we need to look at new materials, testing processes, cell architectures, characterization methods that really give us mechanistic insight, because genuinely this mechanistic insight is what is key. If you look at any of the top battery researchers or any of the top uh, institutions, what they are looking for is mechanistic insight that tells them how the batteries are actually working. The two final uh, points are that there's almost certainly no silver bullet chemistry. Okay, so there is almost certainly nothing that's going to completely cover the energy storage landscape. So we need to develop these chemistries that are tailored to the applications. And then the last thing is just to target difficult scientific problems. Sometimes it can be attractive to just kind of follow the, the, the beaten path. But with these uh, battery development, there are lots of difficult uh, issues that we can actually address. And they're the ones that should be attracting the attention. The final background slide, and I will literally zoom through this in two minutes, is on the metal anode and anode free side of things. That's our, our metal anode at the top right there. We can actually completely remove that lithium potentially and create an even leaner cell here again, where you would just have a cathode uh, on the right hand side, an anode current collector, and cycle the lithium from your uh, cathode material within the cell. 
some of the challenges within this, and this will become important when I show the second study, is on the whole aspect of, of lithium metal plating. OK, so what you see is we have essentially two scenarios or, or two extremes where on the, the schematic that's shown in the middle there, you can end up with what's called dendritic lithium plating. And it's, it's visualized here in the top right. And that causes all sorts of problems in terms of it can potentially short circuit your cell if that goes through the separator. But also what it can do is it can lead to things like dead lithium where you get parts of your electrode that aren't actively cycling. Finally, as well, with the SEI, you can have this essentially a mosaic type structure where you have a, a quite a complex arrangement of inorganic and organic materials that form on your electrode surface. And the uh, difficulty when you move to lithium metal is that the SEI potentially can become very unstable because it may be breaking and, and forming all of the time. OK, so. Again, the idea here, and I think I'm still on time in terms of my, my 25 minute intro, is to give kind of a broad uh, introduction to the energy storage landscape and show some of the motivation for the, the two studies that I'm going to present and basically the research that's coming down the line, certainly from my group within the next five years or so. So the first uh, presentation, uh, the first study to talk about is this amorphization driven uh, sodium alloying in silicon germanium alloy nanowires for sodium ion batteries. And the second one is on the lithiophili uh, lithiophilic nanowire hosts for guided lithium deposition in lithium metal batteries. So a bit of background here, and uh, hopefully people attended uh, my colleague Dr. Ty Kennedy's talk about a month ago. So he talked about lots of the nice work that we have done with silicon and germanium containing nanowires. What we did here is we, we tried to apply them to a different system. So we had all of this synthetic expertise where we had made these different compositions of nanowires, but we had never actively uh, applied them to sodium ion batteries before. So what we have is we basically have a, a kind of a toolkit of materials where we can go from fully silicon up to fully germanium with intermediate composition steps as we go. So the nice thing here is that we can make these completely uh, miscible or completely uniform alloy nanowires with different silicon and germanium ratios. So what we had within this study was we had pure silicon and pure germanium as our two extreme points. And then we had a 75-25 alloy composition in both directions and a 50-50 composition as well. So what we found we had to do to get these essentially to work in a, in a sodium ion cell is that we had to amorphize the material first. So within this, we had all of this expertise on the lithium ion side of things. We knew that the active materials were becoming amorphous during lithium ion cycling. So we intentionally carried out that amorphization within a lithium ion half cell. So for 10 cycles, lithium was cycled in and cycled out of the material, and we ended up with these nice uh, amorphous mesh-like nanowires after our 10 uh, lithiation and delithiation uh, cycles. So essentially what these were was these were then the starting materials for our sodium ion testing that we then applied in subsequent tests. So we now had our, our amorphous uh, starting material with the different compositions, and we could assemble these within sodium ion half cells and look at the performance of them and look at the influence of the composition on the cycling stability, which was the really important thing that we wanted to look at. So what this is, again, I'm partially biased in that I was on the study. I think it's a nice illustration of the importance of the composition on the performance that we actually got. So the only variable within this study was that we had a different anode composition in each test here. So we have a pure amorphous silicon, we have our pure amorphous germanium, and then we have the different alloy compositions in between. So the important thing to notice here is that the uh, amorphous silicon on its own green performed extremely poorly. So we got very, very low capacities for that amorphous silicon here in green. When we had our silicon rich alloy, we had the same issue in that we had a very poor uh, cycling stability and also the capacity itself was very, very low. And it was only when we started to move towards the 50-50 composition and higher that we really got these materials to start performing well. 
So once we got went to 50-50 silicon germanium, we found that after kind of an initial uh, activation effect here where the capacity rose after about 10 cycles, that it gave us very, very stable uh, cycling stability for that 50-50 composition. Whereas when we then move towards even richer uh, germanium compositions, so the one here in red, shown here, is 25% uh, silicon, 75% germanium. That actually performs slightly worse than our 50-50 mixture. And the amorphous germanium, despite having the, the highest initial capacity, actually performed worse than that again. So what we had was we had within this tunability, we had basically two factors at play that were determining the capacity retention over our extended cycling. So just to, to summarize it here, it's shown in this graph down here in B, you can see that the first and 100 cycle is given, the, the most important ones are these three blocks here. So this is our 50-50 alloy, this is our germanium rich alloy, and this is our pure germanium. So the uh, overall capacity retention was highest for the 50-50 mix, was next highest then for our 25-75, and then for the amorphous germanium, we found out that it actually wasn't so stable. So this was, in some ways, was slightly unusual, and we would have seen excellent stability for germanium within lithium ion tests. So within this, then, we wanted to investigate this at a materials level. So see, could we understand why the pure germanium material was actually performing worse than the 50-50 composition? So again, I hope that these are clear. What these are is these are uh, post-mortem SEM and TEM images of the nanowires at different states. So the ones that are shown here are actually just after the lithium ion amorphization step. Okay, so the first column is our 50-50 composition and the second column is our amorphous germanium composition. So at this stage, there is actually no take home message from these two columns. They actually were very, very similar. We had no large scale delamination of the material. They seem to be quite uniform after the lithium ion cycling that we had done. In comparison, when we looked at these after the uh, sodiation cycles, this is after 100 cycles for the sodiation uh, that we had done. What you can see, again, I'll just zoom in here very quickly, is that the large scale, so this is our, our zoomed out image, hopefully it's clear here, is that for the uh, alloy, so the 50-50 composition, that we had very good material retention on the substrate, but that for the amorphous germanium, which is the one here in the top right, that we had far more expansion and there was also evidence that we had delamination locally of some of the active material. So what had happened here is that we believe that this had gone through extra expansion of the amorphous germanium material compared to the 50-50 uh, alloy that we had seen before. So again, we also looked at things like EIS that I won't touch on today just in terms of, of time. Um, and what we also found was that we had extra resistance uh, increases in our amorphous germanium material as well, which we can link to that decrease in the capacity compared to the 50-50. So the conclusions on this study is that the that amorphization step that we identified is crucial for the activation of silicon and germanium containing nanowires in the sodium ion batteries. The amorphous silicon nanowires still didn't activate even once we had done the amorphization. OK, so certainly at this level, it appears that these amorphous uh, silicon nanowires are not a, a potentially useful anode material for, for sodium ion. The uh, diffusivity of the of the sodium within germanium and silicon was a key driver in the performance difference that we saw. So the fact that we were incorporating this germanium within to the alloy within the alloy that has a, a high diffusivity or allows high diffusivity of sodium basically uh, explained why we saw really nice performance for this 50-50 alloy. And then the uh, structural integrity that we also saw indicated that the 50-50 the alloy that we had gave us much better structural integrity than the amorphous germanium. So that paper was published last year in JMCA and there's a, quite a lot of depth in it. There's basically uh, analysis at a materials and electrochemical level at each step. So it's well worth uh, looking into this if you want more details on the study. 
the second one. So this is an exciting new piece of work that we have done. As I said, it will be submitted hopefully uh, very soon. Um, so what we have done here is, is taken our starting materials again, so that the same basic set of materials that we looked at in the sodium ion configuration, but we have completely reimagined the way that we were looking at these for batteries. So the idea here is, is that we grew the uh, silicon, silicon germanium alloy and pure germanium nanowires on a carbon paper. OK, so why we did that will all become very clear in a second. Just to show that um, these are the different steps. So this is our, our starting carbon paper. This is after we electro deposited tin onto them for a, a catalyst layer. And then we grew these dense meshes of nanowires that you can see on the underlying carbon paper here. OK, so the idea with this is to use these as hosts for lithium metal anodes. So the easiest way to do this is to just show two very quick videos. So that video that I'm showing there at the minute, that is molten lithium. Um, and what we're trying to do there is just with the carbon paper as our control material is to try and see will the carbon paper take on some of that molten lithium. And what you can see hopefully clearly from the, the, the video is that it's, it's completely lithiophobic. Okay, it does not want to interact with the lithium and it doesn't wet this carbon paper in any way. So on the other hand here, this is a, a germanium nanowire coated substrate. And what you can see is that just having the wires on the substrate induces a really strong lithiophilic character into the wires. So within less than three seconds, I think I have uh, worked it out to be, we get really nice infilling of this uh, carbon substrate with our molten lithium. OK, so this honestly was a really exciting uh, finding. So just to show that the characteristics there on the left hand side, it was done at 350 degrees. And now that we had these materials, we could start looking at what was really going on at the carbon paper level here. So that was our uh, lithium infiltration uh, process at the top. And then we had our, our high temperature uh, molten lithium infilling here. So looking at, at the materials afterwards, there was a couple of, of really nice findings that we had. So again, within this study, what we could look at was the impact of the, the composition of the wires on the materials that formed, and obviously later then in terms of the, the performance as well. So once the, the molten lithium infilling had been done, what we found is we could still see nanowires. OK, so in this column here, we see for the uh, lithium silicon, the lithium uh, alloy and the lithium germanium that we still could pick out some of the underlying nanowire type uh, morphology, but that they were much larger in diameter. So what had essentially happened here is the nice way of thinking of this is almost like they were straws. So they, they sucked up the, the molten lithium into those nanowires and gave us much larger feature sizes. Importantly, at the, at the macro scale level here, so there's a cross sectional SEM image that we show and what you can see is that we actually have lithium infilling throughout that entire substrate. So what has happened is, is the lithiophilicity that's induced by the wires is throughout that entire substrate. So it's not like we're just coating a small amount of lithium on top of the substrate. The lithium really is being sucked into the overall uh, carbon paper substrate that we have. On the XRD side of things, again, there was lots of really nice findings that we saw here. So the, the chemistry of lithium and germanium and lithium and silicon in terms of the phases that formed is very well known. So there's lots of these uh, different phases that can form things like Li22, Si5, Li22, uh, GE5. And what we found was after this molten lithium uh, infilling step, we had actually generated these phases within the structure. So what had started out as a pristine germanium nanowire or a pristine silicon nanowire had been converted into these lithiated silicon or germanium nanowires. So to do more analysis of these, what we did first was we looked basically at how much lithium had been filled into the substrate. So this was done electrochemically and the lithium was fully stripped out of the, of the samples for the different compositions that we see there. So in each case, we found that we had more than 30 milliamp hours per centimeter squared lithium, which is a very high uh, amount of lithium in terms of, of the capacity that we have there. What's worth flagging here is that the 
features that we see, and hopefully they're, they're clear in the little inflections or the, the bumps that you see in those delithiation profiles, they actually relate to the delithiation of those, de of those lithium containing phases that I mentioned. So for example, for this red one here, this LISI here, this little inflection that you see hopefully in the, uh, the curve there, that corresponds to the delithiation of that lithium silicide phase. So what that tells us is that the lithium itself is being stripped out and it's only right at the end of this lithium removal that we're getting the delithiation of this lithium silicide phase. So just the comparison of this before and after. So the before stripping uh, images are the ones that I showed on the, on the last slide. So in this column here, you can see that we have very dense lithium that is infilled throughout the entire substrate. Whereas when we strip out the, the lithium, you can see that there's far more porosity or there's far more uh, void space within those individual substrates afterwards. So we can essentially fully strip out that lithium without destroying these uh, substrates mechanically. So with this, that we now had our, our basically our material set to do all the electrochemical testing that one would expect here. So uh, symmetric cell testing is very often used to kind of gauge the mechanistic or the, the stability of uh, kind of simple lithium plating and stripping processes. So what we have is for our various uh, samples here, we did a, a symmetric cell where it was at a capacity of one milliamp hour per centimeter squared and a current density of one milliamp per centimeter squared, which is kind of the, the standard within the within the literature. So what we saw with this, and, and again, it, this is all data that's kind of crammed on top of each other, but it's quite clear that as a function of our electrode that we have, so moving from left to right from lithium to the lithium silicon to the alloy and then all the way up to germanium that we're increasing the stability of that lithium and stripping plating so what you can see and i'll just show that the summary of it down at the bottom is the way that this is typically analyzed or, or typically diagnosed is by looking at this over potential that you see for the lithium stripping and plating process so when we have the lithium here what happens is essentially it starts out much higher than the other three samples and then it drastically increases okay so that can be linked back to all of the the kind of fundamental issues that i mentioned in terms of of pristine lithium anodes so things like uneven um, plating and stripping it can be due to sei formation on the layers as well that can can increase that over potential over time so again it was with the germanium containing samples so the orange trend here in b that we saw that we had very stable stripping and plating up to about a thousand hours for this sample again which in terms of the, the state of the art and, and the literature is right up there in terms of giving us really stable plating and stripping of lithium also within this we could look at this um, as a function of the applied current so varying it from 0.5 milliamps per, per centimeter squared all the way up to three which is a reasonably aggressive uh, plating and stripping current and again we found the exact same trend here so the the germanium containing anode or the pure germanium anode here was the uh, most stable essentially over time and you can see all of these anodes so as soon as we move away from our standard pristine lithium which is the gray data here you can see that you have a dramatic decrease in that over potential given for our plating and we could also look then at the SEM of this in the different states. So this is in our stripped and plated state. And we can link back the morphology of the lithium that we plate to the performance that we see. Okay, so we can basically tie the whole study together and explain why we see that decreased over potential for our different compositions. So the important thing here is the right hand column. So our plating is on the, the right hand side. For the silicon containing anode you can see that our feature size is quite large okay so i hope that's clear here in the in the top right we have micron scale uh, lithium plating features here and it, overall it's quite an, a non-uniform substrate that we can see when we move to the germanium and silicon alloy which is in the middle 
we essentially get a smaller feature size of our plated lithium and it's only once we move down to the pure germanium here that we get a far more uniform lithium plating across that entire substrate. And just finally then on the performance side, to assemble these within full cells, so this is a lithium uh, metal anode, so either pristine lithium or our hosted uh, lithium anodes that we have just um, prepared. And we tested them in two different cell configurations. So this was within a lithium sulfur arrangement. The only difference here was we had a different anode. All of the other components were the same. And what we found was by just changing out the anode, the important thing here again is the, is the orange and gray, because they're the two extremes of the study, is that for the uh, germanium containing host of anode, that we were uh, able to retain 835 milliamp hours per gram after 200 cycles. And for an identical cell, except one that had a lithium anode in it, it was only 498. Okay, so what we were seeing was that we had a, a pretty dramatic increase in our cycling stability by removing out this lithium metal anode and replacing it with one of the hosted anodes that we have here. And we could link this back again to the morphology of the anode after cycling. So this is our anode that is taken directly out of that cell here in, in grey at the top, and this is the one that's taken out of the orange one. You can see in the pristine lithium, it's really non-uniform. We have large cracks within the surface, and you could immediately think that we now have dead lithium or we have issues where that anode is not operating at 100% in terms of its performance. The other one was on LFP. So again, it's the same sort of idea. We took our various hosted anodes and we compared them with a control lithium metal anode. And what we found was it followed the exact same trend here where our germanium was the best performing, our alloy or our 50-50 mix in the middle was the next best. And even then our, our silicon uh, containing one, which was shown in purple here, dramatically outperforms this uh, pristine lithium metal that we had here. Okay, so hopefully I haven't overshot it drastically, but just a couple of, of conclusions and, and an overview on, on what I had hoped to get across is, is the idea that the energy storage sector in general or the battery development space, it's a really exciting and diverse field where there's lots of potential for breakthrough, but we need to be careful with claims. Okay, so the idea that we've come up with an earth shattering new you know, silver bullet chemistry, we need to be cautious with that sort of claim. Hopefully, again, with the two the two studies that I've shown is is to show that that materials focused approach is the way forward. So where we can link what we see at the materials level back to the uh, performance that we see is really, really important. Um, that beyond lithium ion, so things like sodium ion development, that it can build on what we know from lithium ion. So we can kind of draw from inspiration on lithium ion and what's been done already. And then the last one, so particularly this work that isn't published yet, this I would say is almost the tip of the iceberg and what we can do here. So that lithiophilic material that we've made, they're really interesting from uh, lithium metal anode side of things. And hopefully we've seen that that study shows immense potential. And I just say, watch this space on that. So with this, I just want to thank the people who uh, contributed to this. So mostly the two studies that were done were, were led by Saeed, who's a, a PhD student working on my uh, surge project, and also then all of the various collaborators who've worked on it here and abroad as well. OK, and hopefully answer any questions that people might have. Thanks. Cheers. Thank that, was, that was really clear. Really, that was a really good Take a break. Here, and, uh, and the second part was top, really good. There's time for questions. Uh, so I'll read this out this question from John Halloran. Uh, sure. When you say the LFP cathode is a retrograde step over the NCA and the Testa, what does this mean in practical terms? A heavier battery, slower charging, um, and is it the cost and sustainability are better, I believe you were saying? Exactly. Yeah. So that, that's the right angle, John. So it, it, the idea is in terms of the energy density of it, it's lower. Um, so mm -hmm. it would mean that you would it would mean a heavier battery for the same range, but they are targeting the kind of mass 
aspect of it. So it, it would be the medium range ones. The high range or the long range ones will also will always have the higher energy density materials. But what it does show is that they're they're pulling towards the sustainability side of things on their medium range vehicles. So there, there's kind of push and pull factors and, and it, it was surprising, I think, to a lot of people that they went back to a material that has been known for, you know, in excess of 15 years, I would guess, on, on LFP. Uh, on that note, Hugh, I, I had a question on the, the first slide. Yeah. When you scale, you had a slide there showing we scaled up from a mobile phone to a um, yes. Tesla. Uh, the cost factor was about 7,000 versus 30. Yes. Something like that, but you had far more units in the Tesla than you had on, like if you, I think a thousand units went into the Tesla. Yes. So your, your scale up was um, whatever, 20 or 20, 30, uh, so 200, whereas going to the module in, it was much, much higher cost. Sure. Is, is there, is, yeah, there. yeah, yeah. So the the thing with that one, the the, the LIB that's shown there, it, it was almost a, um, something they did as a novelty. So they, this this is the other side of things. This is uh, certainly at the time when I made this was the largest lithium ion battery in yeah. the world, yeah. and because it's so big, it has all of these extra uh, safety okay. side of things, and it has all of these extra bells and whistles, okay. Okay. and it will be linked back to the materials that are in it as well. Yeah, yeah. So okay. all I all I saw was the headline value of that. I didn't get into the the nitty gritty of it, and I'd like to see where where that breakdown actually okay. came with. So it's not scaling as such, it's, it's, it's an actual different module. Maybe. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And, and it's integrating all of those together and it's all of the BMS and all of the extra little bits as well. Hi, Hi Hugh, uh, great talk uh, today. Um, you work on both 100% silicon anodes and lithium metal anodes. Yes. In your opinion, which of those will be commercialized first and, and second part, if they were both commercialized? Is there space for both of those, or will one dominate over the other? Tricky question, I know. Nice, nice, easy, <laughs> nice, easy question. It, it depends what you believe on 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 some of the commercialization side of things. So there are companies who who have commercial 100% silicon anodes, and there are companies who have 100% lithium metal, or even anode free. If you talk about someone like QuantumScape, so I would say even they're not fully. It's not fully clear what level they can be used at yet and where the development really is. Um, I, I'd be on, I don't think either is very easy in the, in the short term. Both of them are still have challenges, I would say. And I don't want to hang my hat on one. <laughs> I'll, I'll get off the fence maybe on the next time I do it. Good answer. Thank you. Okay, I have another question. Here. Can you do ab initio modeling to predict the kind of structure that you want? for your materials rather than, because you have to test them and then see what they, so is there a scope to actually inform your preparation of materials by modeling the properties of the, the, the yeah. result? Of well, that's that's the dream in some ways, and it's certainly the way that the, the battery development is going at the European level. Yeah. Uh, so there's lots of, of AI type, big map is, is, is a big project where they're looking at using uh, machine learning and, and all the kind of buzzwords that can have real impact. Yeah. Um, at, at a local level, we're, we're starting up collaboration with Damien Thompson's group, where we're trying to bring in modeling onto it. Yeah. Um, to really, and again, it, the idea is you want predictive modeling is is the yeah. Yeah. is a nice aspect of it. Yeah. Yeah. So again, hopefully in the in the next talk we'll have some nice findings on that. But it's certainly the way that yeah. the European research is going. There's lots of uh, focus on that AI and machine learning driven materials development. Would that then be just kind of mere brute force rather than informed choice? It's <sighs> a good question. I. I would say I'm, I'm, they, I'm looking at this with chemistry. Yeah, well, so, I would say that right, they so would say it's process. it's informed decisions. <laughs> Whether it is or not is is maybe yeah. debatable. Yeah. 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 Um, question of Sean. Uh, would you expect the lithium to be integrated into the alloy surface a bit for silicon germanium and silicon germanium in addition to coating surface on top during the plating? I could give a very glib answer, and I, 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 insofar as I was saying, that is exactly what we're working with, Shayan and Damien on. Um, but yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. Is it, and it, it's 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 how much of, of the surface level processes are really 
influence in the performance that's of interest to us. Um, because what we have seen, again, not to give the game away on the modeling side, is that there is a difference between the different compositions that we can link back to the performance. Um, but as I said, with the, the the material development, we really have only scratched the surface on that. There's lots of extra studies where we're looking at different cell configurations and how we bring that process of the lithophilicity into play. There's lots more that we can do and have started. Okay. Okay. Uh, so in the lithium metal batteries, you observe with the silicon and germanium. Germanium is performing better than silicon. Do you think is it related to the uh, diameter of the nanowires? And is the same in silicon and germanium? It's something we haven't systematically looked at, but can do, particularly like you're, see the, you're seeing in terms of the feature size of the yeah. lithium plating. It would be very interesting if we could take a range of, say, fix it in germanium and take a, a, a four different batches of wires that have 25, 50, 75, 100, and systematically look at it. Um, I w it, it's something that had kind of dawned on me a couple of weeks ago that we should try. So, yeah, no, it's, it's a really good question and something we will look at because it could it could play a role. 